Hello, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Let's Talk Housing. My name's Brennan Thomas. If you don't know me already, I am the co-host here alongside Stephen Thomas, chief economist and founder of Reports on Housing. Today, we will discuss the most recent news and statistics, properly setting and facing expectations, ADUs, re recent increase in rates, and much more. But first... Stephen, what is happening in the large Thomas household? Only not a lot. Because <laughs> everybody can't wait to get to the new year so they can, you know, kind of work on some stuff and then ditch those New Year's resolutions like normal people. But our family is not normal because we have three birthdays in a row on January 3rd, January 7th, January 14th. That was my birthday. Um, glad it's all done. And so now we can focus on other things, don't have to worry about another birthday coming up. Uh, the next birthday in the family isn't until Nana has her birthday as well as Zeke is coming up in February. So we have time. We're talking now February. So uh, we get to relax and we're just doing the status quo. The only person, uh, we have uh, one kid that's uh, at high school level doing sports. Uh, she's in soccer. And uh, so we get to see a soccer game or two per week. and. It's kind of a light load until we get further into the spring. So, uh, you know, not a lot going on other than the status quo, going to school, coming home, going, doing my, my work, enjoying my work, and that's it. So that's where we're at. But more importantly, what's going on in Brennan's world? Honestly, just about the same. Just been living life. Not much exciting has really happened. A lot of the exciting stuff for me is revolved around soccer and my team, but we've been on a break, so it's been a little bit difficult for me to watch other teams and me missing out on that experience, but I get to experience it tomorrow, Saturday the 20th at 4.30 in the morning, so <laughs> it'll be bright and early, but it is worth it every single time I am ready for it to be back, and win or lose, I, it's just a blast to even watch, but we like would usual, be talking Steven, about, wait, we would what? be we would be talking about the Ducks because we're a Ducks family. And unfortunately, the Ducks haven't been doing well every single year. And every single year, I hear, get to hear my sons say, wait until uh, the draft because we're going to get a high draft pick. I'm tired of high draft picks. I want to go to a playoff game. We haven't been in the playoffs for a long time. So time to make that change because like half of the NHL goes into the playoffs and yet the Ducks can't make it in. So they're not as good as, as you know, half the NHL. And they're always like tinkering around on the bottom of the NHL. So it's time to fix something. We're definitely on the come up. That's all I have to say. That's what my brother and I talk about all the time. It's We think it's 2025 is the year for us. So Fingers crossed, because I would love to go to a playoff game, too. It's been forever, but we'll just have to see. I think it, it looks good from my point of view. Just maybe one more year. We'll have to see. Yeah, we'll <laughs> see. Steven, what's happening in the real estate world with supply, demand, and expected market time? It's official. We started the winter market. Gone are the holidays. And you know how I know that? Because I have... Uh, I, I, Get off the freeway and I head uh, up towards home for me. And off the freeway is a big LA fitness. And in that LA fitness has a bunch of treadmills and bikes that face the street. And uh, that first uh, couple weeks of January, you look over there and oh my gosh, there's a lot of people just, you know, huffing and puffing and doing their little New Year's resolutions. And uh, I went by there this week, <laughs> ghost town. Everybody's done with their New Year's resolutions. A lot of people are, and uh, they've moved on. And now they are uh, doing all the things that they normally do, including if they were looking for a home or they were interested in looking for a home, they're back. And so this begins, it's right at the midpoint of January, our winter markets. The holidays don't last that long. The holiday market starts from the middle of November and ends in the middle of January. So it's just a couple months long. That's what we call the holiday market. Then we actually get the winter market. That's from the middle of January to the middle of March, also just a couple months long. And uh, it doesn't quite follow, like I, I call it the winter market, but it doesn't exactly follow winter because winter started in December. And each of the markets, I call it the spring market, 
it's just a little bit different. Uh, so the spring market actually ends on May 31st. And in June is where we see a difference in the housing market. I call that the summer market. So they line up kind of mainly in those uh, different seasons. And what happens with the winter market is we have not much change in supply. There was this bump in uh, from our first reading that first week of, of uh, January to last uh, to the second week of January. There was a bump in inventory, which is uh, I, you kind of see that in normal years, actually not as big of a bump as what we saw. It was it was strange. It was like a whole bunch of people that had come off the market were ready to come back on. Instantly, we saw this bump in inventory. It, it was seen across the United States besides in SoCal. But then. From that reading to where we are, where we're recording this uh, podcast uh, on the 19th of January, we actually didn't see much of a change in inventory from last week to this week. But for the two week change looks really large, but it really was that it was two weeks ago that 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 uh, week from that point on. So this last week, not a big change. Now, what we did see is there are there must be more homes coming on the market. We don't do that reading until we get to the end of the month. But there are typically there are more homes that come on the market in January, definitely than uh, than uh, November, December, November, December, home to the fewest homes come in the market, then it starts to get more in January, kind of similar in February, because uh, but there's fewer days of the month. Not this February. There's actually 29 days, so we can definitely see that we'll probably get a little bit more inventory than we normally do in a normal February because we have an extra day to, to make that happen. But uh, what we'll see from this point on is inventory actually not changing much. Typically, this is what happens. And even last year, it actually went down. It's where uh, inventory actually uh, dropped and that's not customary either, but we're not gonna get a big change in inventory. Now on demand side, that's a snapshot of pending sales activity, recent pending sales activity, we call it 30 days, the last 30 days of pending sales activity. And it's starting to scream higher. Matter of fact, every day that I'm looking at it, it's getting rid of these slower days of December. And now we're adding a day in January where things are getting a little bit uh, uh, at a hotter pace. So we're seeing demand on a daily basis rise. And so if you have demand rising and the active listing inventory remaining, the available number of homes remaining the same, and yet demand is rising, that's quickening the pace of the market. So across the board, every market that I've looked at is actually the pace is getting faster. And I just snapped a whole bunch today. I did Sacramento. I did the Bay Area. We did Phoenix. Uh, and we did uh, Vegas. And then, uh, of course, all of SoCal and Santa Barbara even. Uh, so there's a lot of markets, with the exception of one, Los Angeles. I can't put my finger on what's going on with Los Angeles, and it's not normal. So something's going on in L.A. that I can't quite uh, know yet because we're too new into this year. And, and I don't think it's going to stick. But if it does, it's going to say something that's going on in Los Angeles that we need to explore a little bit further. So uh, that's what's going on right now. We are entered the holiday, uh, the winter market. Gone is that holiday market. So then entering this new year, it feels like we've heard nothing but positive data from December. How are we looking for year over year statistics for supply and demand? It, now, that is very market specific. Now, um, uh, most markets have less supply than last year that we checked. And demand is a little bit uh, higher right now than where it was last year. And we're not talking big, giant changes because still we're talking January. There's not these, it's not the spring yet where we have the most activity, the most homes coming on the market, as well as the most pending sales. That's where it peaks out uh, during the spring. What we're dealing with right now is uh, it's, it's, kind of just moving along at, at, at a pace where the expected market time has dropped considerably compared to last year. So last year we were dropping, but we started off the year with better expected market times. And this is not days on the market. I have to explain this to everybody over and over again because I'm not a days on the market fan, which is why we even came up with the expected market time. I was a, a real estate agent and broker back in the day, and this is how I explained it to to everybody. It's you, you can see that I, I needed to capture any fluctuations in the supply and any fluctuations in the number of pending sales. That will tell you 
uh, if there's all of a sudden a big spike in supply, well, your market's going to be slow. Days of market would actually drop then, but the market's slow because you have all these new homes to compete against. And that's exactly what happened when I developed the housing report back in 2004. So uh, people had the wrong expectations as a whole bunch of homes came on the market. So uh, so expect a market time as you place your home on market when you open up escrow. And we're less than where we were last year at this time. And it's dropping fast, just like it always does in January. It gets faster and faster and faster and typically uh, bottoms out where we have the fastest market times in March. So from here on, the market's just going to continue to speed up. And the longer you wait to go buy it, find a home, the more competition there's going to be com competition among buyers. So my question to you, at least for 2023, as far as that year goes, has the luxury market changed at all in any of the counties that we track? Yeah, so a loaded question. Yes, luxury changed in uh, the, uh, they're pretty much the same in all the counties that I, I was looking at, except for San Diego County. And what happened was Orange County used to be more affordable than LA for luxury. And then everybody, uh, Orange County become the it place. Also, uh, it doesn't have some of the things that people uh, are uh, not attracted to in Los Angeles. It, they're more attracted to Orange County. It's now that they have this, uh, you could work from home or have this, you know, this hybrid work from home and go to the office maybe a couple days per week. A lot more people are choosing to live in Orange County. Now, on top, now what we're having is, uh, see, so Orange County became even more expensive uh, luxury. Some of the coastal stuff, of course, in LA and Malibu in that area is still extremely expensive, but it's extremely expensive in Orange County along the coast when you get to Corona Del Mar, Newport Coast, Laguna Beach. And then, but it's made people go further south in the San Diego County. So San Diego County is where we're seeing this big write up. So we're now talking Del Mar, La Jolla, uh, there's Rancho Santa Fe, there's different areas of, of, El, of San Diego that were just absolutely booming. And the luxury market just kept on going to the point where when we look at luxury, our definition is the top 10% of value. For the prior year well when we looked at 2023 is just about at two million dollars so san diego county gets to join los angeles county and orange county at their threshold for luxury being two million plus welcome to very very high priced areas see in, in the rest of the country uh it's more like eight hundred thousand, like double what the median is well it's similar here it's double the median you're at two million dollars so uh luxury is just off the charts here along socal so i wanted to ask you which is maybe what some of our viewers may be asking is what is happening with rates it seems as if it's the most unpredictable data point to sort of follow right now yeah, it's never been extremely predictable, although we used to have, we didn't have the gyrations and mortgage rates like, we, like we've like we had over the, the past uh, couple of years now, 2022 through 2023, now we're into 2024, and it just hasn't stopped. And, and that is because of, uh, you know, we still are dealing with this in, the inflation reads, which are, uh, everything looks fine on the inflation front. And um, I, I just wish uh, some of the, uh, some of the, the lagged indicators that they look at, mainly shelter, the biggest component of, of these inflation reads. It's it's too lagged. As a matter of fact, it's more lagged than what they originally thought. And I, I listened to some really sharp economists where this is what they, that's all they do is look at inflation and they talk about it. And even they're a little perplexed about how long it's going to take for this finally to come down. It may be how they, they, they read it. It's old and slow the way that they read it. It's this it's the wrong way of, of doing it, but unfortunately, it's, it's how they 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 uh, get their information and and calculate the data, and that's what they utilize. So we're waiting for this to come down, and it is coming down. Like uh, this this last inflation read was higher than expectations, and and it was actually one of the the core components was shelter was a little bit higher than expectations, and you wouldn't even know it, but a lot of that uh, that increase actually came from not. Uh, owner's equivalent rent, which is this dumb statistic, that's actually doing fine. It's It was hotels. Hotels actually make it into that shelter thing, and hotels got a little costlier in December. So as a result, that's what we saw in inflation. So we saw 
core not come down as much as uh, as people would like. But it is coming down. That that's that that inflation read is, is fine. But what this has to do with in, in interest rates is now everybody's looking at every single solitary piece of economic news to calculate where the Fed's going to go, what makes the Fed happy and unhappy. And because they already know that once the in, uh, inflation comes down enough, the Fed is actually overly restrictive right now. And in, in, my, uh, in, in my personal opinion and what we look at, we think they're grossly over and they should probably reduce, uh, reduce the uh, short-term rate significantly. And I'm talking like three quarters of a percent drop right now and inflation would still come down. They did their work, uh, and, but right now I think that they're waiting, and they're gonna. They could end up waiting too long and damaging the economy. That's the issue that that I'm worried about because they're so hyper focused on on uh, the labor side of things. So the different statistics that have come out that inflation as labor this week we had uh, consume uh, not consumer we had uh, consumption that was uh, too hot too. So. In January of last year, we had these nice readings, and then we kept on dropping in interest rates. We had the duh, the uh, the Fed they met in uh, December, and they came out what is referred to as dovish, where they're they're actually saying, yeah, you know what, we're probably going to reduce the short term rate next year, twenty twenty four, which we're in right now, probably three times. That's what they came up with. And starting, they don't know, they don't tell you exactly when they're starting, but the markets thought it was going to happen in March. Well, it's not looking so much like March right now after what's happened this, this month in January because rates fell down nicely, but they've been slowly easing up report after report after report. And what was weird is we had the uh, housing uh, numbers come in and it, it looked very sickly for the month of December. There weren't that many units and it was, it was less than expectations. And yet today the, uh, we, we saw that uh, rates actually increased a tiny, tiny bit. Uh, maybe they were flat. It just depends upon, uh, I haven't really looked at it today, but we still had the 10-year treasury going up, which was opposite of what you thought would, would happen. But we'll get more data points coming out as we get, uh, we're bleeding into, we're almost done with January. Once we get to February, I think that we're going to have the opposite. So we had the opposite of what was January last year. I think we're going to get the opposite for February because last February was too hot. And that's where we saw rates starting to rise last year was the initial, the jobs report, that first jobs Friday, which was February 3rd. And uh, last year, this year, we're going to see something a little bit different. So I actually anticipate rates to drop a little bit from, from here once we get into February, but they're kind of stuck right at that 7% with no points right now. So according to the Mortgage Bankers Association, mortgage application spiked 9.9% week, or, yeah, week over week, even with rates rising. If we haven't seen as large of a sign before, does this show the effect of rates dropping below 7% and the end of the holiday season demand? We're going to have to look at this data point going forward. This is good news. I mean, yes, we're getting more applications, but now you have to realize the application readings that we were getting were all white noise. It's the holiday market. So that is still noise from the holiday market. As a matter of fact, year over year looking at it, not good. No bueno. It's actually way down compared to last year at this time. So I, I, I took a look at that and that could still be that interest rates are a bit too high across the country. Now, I'm not seeing that in SoCal markets as well as I'm not seeing it in all those markets that I mentioned earlier in, in this podcast. It, we're actually seeing this rise in pending sales that's outperforming last year. We're seeing that the expected market time is a little bit uh, better. That's the market time, how fast the market's moving uh, compared to last year. But overall, I want to start to see where the data points go toward, as we uh, leave the end of January because there's a lot of noise in it. Year over year, we're still down, but this could go up really quick. This is only like the first week is really this week. So I'm more interested to see what it does starting next week and, and uh, on. And I want to look at year over year data because if we have fewer uh, applications than last year, that doesn't bode well for pending sales and then closed sales. So that's what we're going to be looking at really closely because I actually anticipate that we're going to have more applications this year and more pending sales and more closed sales. It's just a matter of when that starts to happen. And we are watching it very closely like everybody else. 
But I'm also seeing articles that bidding words have re-entered our market as we dipped under 7% rates. What are you seeing in our local markets? Yeah, well, that is exactly what we're seeing now in our local markets because across the United States, we actually have more inventory than last year at this time. And there are not that many markets that we are tracking, that, uh, which I named, that actually have uh, more inventory than last year. It's actually less inventory than last year is the, is, uh, the uh, you know, the, the majority of the markets that we're, we're looking at, just with the exception of a couple. And really, that what that what that means is is that the market is a bit hotter than where we were at at, at this time. So uh, last year, so last year we really quickly evolved into a very very hot spring market, and in many markets, many many markets were what I refer to as insane. And for our threshold, that is uh, when we look at all the inventory and all of recent demand when it when that threshold gets at 40 days for the entire county and below that's what we refer to as insane it rarely happens it happened during covid it happened last year for a little while when we were in the spring but rates continued to rise and we we slowed down and then in uh also happened in 2013 for a short period of time at the uh, beginning of spring but that's the direction that we're going right now Typically, it gets a lot hotter. I told you we start off this year hotter than last year, and we got to an insane market last year in many markets. That means that we're moving towards insane. So that entry-level market, you guys, everybody out there knows what entry-level means. And yeah, unfortunately, Southern California along the coast, we're looking at 750000 to a million is the uh, detached home. That is the hottest market. That's where it's absolute insanity with uh, multiple offers. Now, what happens as we get more and more insane is it's not just the entry level. It's many, many markets. And it can't even be luxury if the luxury property is is priced right and uh, it has a lot of bells and whistles, that type of thing. So then to this day, I know this may not come as a surprise to you, but I'm still seeing a lot of articles talking about the Airbnb bust and shadow inventory claims saying that they will free up a lot more inventory. As time has progressed, has anything changed? No, this drives me nuts. But these are the, what happens. We have these these uh, these long term perma bears that are looking for something to change and they hold on to it. Uh, so closely uh, at the best, and they 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 want to see that something uh, changes, and it's just not going to happen. We just don't see it. Uh, this shadow inventory that people refer to is just absolutely ridiculous. They've been talking about shadow inventories for a long time. Airbnb bust, for Pete's sake, we uh, th there aren't even that many Airbnbs across the United States, anyways. If you look at the, if all of them came to market, it would be like I think it's at one point one million. Uh, we're at 1 million homes across the United States, according to the National Association of Realtors right now at the uh, start of this year. 1 million homes. We were at 4 million during the Great Recession. Even if we had 1 million more, we'd just be at 2 million, which is still not even quite where we were prior to the uh, uh, during, build up prior to the Great Recession and during the Great Recession. This is just not going to happen. We don't see it. We can actually see the buildup prior to the Great Recession. This is not going to happen. This is just this wishful thinking because I've asked this for many, many years now. Where is the inventory going to come from? It's got to come from someplace. Is it the shadow inventory? Stop us from talking about shadow inventory. It's been We've been doing the shadow inventory since 2012. It's time to get off that bus. It's time. And it, that, it doesn't exist. So it's time to get off that bus and bus and get onto something else. I guess it's the Airbnb bus. That, they've been talking about that for uh, a couple of years now. That's not materialized either. So you better find a different bus. Where's the inventory going to come from? Because not all those Airbnb people across the United States are going to place their homes on the market at the same time, period. And they're not all of a sudden going to outlaw, nope, can't have Airbnbs. Because you know what I'm doing right now? I'm actually, this weekend, we're going to search up Airbnbs because we want to go on vacation. When we go on vacation, we like to stay in Airbnbs because our family's too large. So I'm looking at Airbnbs and I'm part of the problem. I, demand for Airbnbs still exists and it will continue to exist. So go find some other avenue where you think inventory is going to come from and tell me what it is because I'm perplexed. I don't know where it's going to come from. So as we can 
Well, it's definitely pinned today's higher rates to the Fed raising the federal funds rate. Um, but is it safe to say mortgage rates during the pandemic is the main cause to the effect we are seeing in today's economy? Yeah. Um, yes, absolutely. I really do think that uh, the Fed, the, they're, they kept the the short term rate at zero for too long, and it was kind of like uh, extra rocket fuel. And we noted we knew that it was extra rocket fuel if you were in real estate. And everybody that was in real estate was loving that extra rocket fuel until that rocket fuel was taken away. And um, so the argument actually is part of that run up is due to uh, being uh, too overly accommodating, like the Fed was for too long. And they actually saw it. And now we can more Monday morning quarterback because I, I, the Fed actually does serve a great purpose. But a lot of times they react too late, but they do per, uh, perform a great service. I've had some people say we should get rid of the Fed. That's a bunch of junk. Uh, we definitely need the Fed because we showed that markets can't work on their own. That was the subprime crisis and everything else. So we did need we do need somebody that's banning the bus. Unfortunately, this bus driver, the bus drivers are a little bit old and slow and they react a little bit late. So uh, they bump into things and uh, on that bus, but they kept it at zero for too long and they kept it at zero all the way till we got to March of 2022 when there were signs. And I know that they were talking about it during the summer of 2021 and during the summer of 2021, let's call it July or even August. They could have been way ahead of the curve, done it in August and uh, started to raise the rates immediately. So they were scared. And they wanted to wait until they said enough and different things to move markets to make sure that it wouldn't scare a bunch of people and that we wouldn't get a, 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 a cataclysmic event in the economy. So they waited far too long to start raising that rate. So that added more juice because all of 2021, we, we, it was hotter and hotter and hotter until we got to, it wasn't until the start of 2022 when rates started to change and people realized, oh my gosh, rates are changing. We should have done it six months prior and we wouldn't have got as big of a run up in values and uh, had as many people that qualified at these ultra low rates because those rates continued all the way through January of 2022. So knowing sort of where we came from and now that we're looking into 2024, how can people properly set expectations for this year? Yeah, I, the best thing to do, it's super hard because setting expectations, if you're left on your own laurels, you'll go find whatever it is you're looking for. You want to look for a market crash, you're going to find many people that are going to sound convincing wearing a suit just like myself, but that have no economic background and they're not housing analysts, but they talk about it all the time. Or we have the different real estate agents across the United States actually that have doom channels because they have enough clicks on it where they actually get paid. I've actually seen a rise in the number of those that exist as well. The problem with that stuff is you can't be doomed forever because then you become perma bears and they start saying things that are just not grounded in fact. And uh, at, the end of the, at the end of the day, those aren't, that's not where to go. You, you don't want to like massively Google it, search it. You got to actually listen to housing analysts. And there's only a few really solid housing analysts across the United States. That that's what their lane is. It's not Wall Street economists because there's plenty of Wall Street economists that have made predictions that are just junk. Like at, last year at this time, there was a Wall Street firm. Their economist said that San Diego County was going to be one of the four worst performing housing markets and that they there would be a crash in prices uh, and listed off the four. By the way, they were wrong on all four and San Diego County was the hottest county in, in uh, California. And it was one of the most, uh, it was one of the hottest uh, counties in the United States as well. So they were totally wrong. That's not their lane. They can talk about, uh, uh, you know, equity market like crazy and, I would listen to them and learn something from them, but they're, they shouldn't be uh, prognosticating what's going to happen in housing. And so who do you go to? It's very, very hard because you're going to hear a lot of numbers. You're going to hear a lot of noise, but it is somebody like what we do. Very few of us exist across the United States. So I'm not a cheerleader for housing. I'm here to set expectations of boys and girls, men and women across the United States. Let's get this thing going. Let's Put on our big boy and big girl pants and figure things out and make good decisions and good choices 
based upon real solid facts and don't be like sticking to what uh, some YouTube channel is going to say. There's going to be this wave of foreclosures or a crash in values or anything like that because they are they're bringing up the wrong statistics, statistics, data, and fa data and facts. So then how would you recommend for people to face the expectations? So after looking at this and listening to this kind of uh, understanding really what's going on in the marketplace, leaning into a housing analyst like what we do, it's actually then to, you don't ask me if it's a good time to buy. You shouldn't be asking me that. Instead, you need to look at your own finances, your own situation, your own budget. We don't know what that looks like. And you sit down, you come up with a budget and you figure, you know what, I, I want to see how much I qualify for. Then you sit down at the lender, and then from that lender, you determine how much you qualify for a home, and then you start looking for those homes, and you'll know if you are ready to purchase at this time. And based upon all the facts and everything else that we are prognosticating, are we going to be 100% 100 correct as to how 2024 is going to, is going to uh, uh, you know, develop? Absolutely not. Our, our forecast was for three different scenarios. It's when's the economy cool, spring, summer, or fall. And there's a lot that can happen. So a lot can happen anyways that we don't know about. But based upon everything we see is that the economy is eventually going to cool. How about that? And then that means that rates will fall. And when rates fall, demand increases. And then as rates fall enough, more homes will start coming on the market this locked in effect that people talk about. We call it hunkering down because they're enjoying these low rates, but as rates fall enough, some of these people will place their homes on the market. But the pace of the number of homes coming on, uh, on the market won't equal how fast demand increases. So demand will outpace the, the extra supply, which means that markets will be extremely hot and values will rise. That is what we're seeing. We've recommended for a year now that people purchase. And I still feel that today based upon everything that we're seeing. It's just a matter of when it's going to happen, not if. So to try and help fix the supply problem, homeowners are now eligible to sell ADUs in California. The only constraint to the, those selling them is that they will have to create an HOA. Is this a viable option to help the first time buyers or prospective buyers enter the market? It focuses on the supply side. I like that. Any time that governments uh, in, in the uh, state, in, you know, county, local, uh, city, uh, county, uh, state, United States, when they start focusing on the inventory uh, side of the equation, which is where we have the problem supply, then I'm all for it. Uh, it just has to, it has to somewhat make sense. There's some people that, are, that aren't uh, too hip on this idea of uh, what this is, is you can have an ADU in your uh, in, in, in the backyard of a, a residence and actually turn it into a the, the ADU plus the house in the front into a condominium complex and have an HOA. And then you can sell that ADU. So uh, will this add inventory? Yes. Uh, so yeah, it, it would add a little bit. Of, it won't really grossly change things, but it will add more uh, numbers of available units across the United States. So it's working on the wrong thing. California just announced today that they have this special program where uh, they, uh, where you get this exceptional, you can get into a home. It's like, you, I don't remember all the details of it, but it's, it's to assist buyers in getting in a home. And it's, we don't need more demand right now. They did it last year. It, the program had so many uh, millions of dollars and it ran out in like a week. Well, they brought it back again, but once again, what is it adding to? The buy side, the demand side. We don't need to fix the demand side of the, the equation. It is the supply side that's broken. So the more ways that we can look at fixing the supply side of the equation, the, the better. That's, that's, that's what our opinion is, and they need to look at other ways. We have plenty of other ideas around this issue as well. So the national office vacancy rate rose 40 BPS to a record breaking 19.6%. Could we see any large changes to the commercial industry in 2024 or should we expect more from future years? Yeah, unfortunately, this is not the, uh, the 
commercial market is not the same as what it was back in the day. As I was talking to you about this before, because uh, I remember I got into the business in 1991. We didn't have computers. You had to go to an office to interact with people, to get paper, to make copies, things like that. When you made flyers back in the day, you actually had to, to uh, cut out pieces, put it on a piece of paper and figure out and then put a, a, a photo that you had developed and uh, paste it to the front and then make uh, copies of this. So that's what we had to do back in the day. And you had to go to an office to do all of that. You didn't work from home. Yeah, I mean, you could do some stuff, but in order to get things signed, you actually had to go to people's houses. You had to go to buyer's houses. You had to go present it, the offer back in the day to sellers. If you were representing the buyer and the listing agent would be there, it was, this, it was a totally different way of doing business. That required office space. And now it, COVID just made this transition happen faster. It happened so fast that everybody was working from home because we had to, there was a pandemic. And now it's come back a bit so that you have some people that are still uh, you know, working from home only than companies, but there are others where there's this blend. It's, it's actually hybrid model where it's, you, you go, you work from home for a few days, but then you come in the office for a couple of days, that type of thing. And, and uh, then there's some, there's a requirement to come in the office. So, uh, I think there that we're moving away from that requirement to come to the office. There will be still some industries where you have to do that. And we all know the different services where you have to do that. You you can't work from home and uh, clean a hotel room and or work a bar, that type of thing. So <laughs> there, it's not entirely gone, but it's commercial space that we're talking about. So what what's happening here is we're going to have to figure out with vacancy rates going up so much, what are we going to do with that space? We're going to get creative and there's going to be creative things to put into that space. However, one of the answers is, what do we need a lot of? I think it's housing. I think it's more units. So there could be a blend. And what I've seen is some will actually turn into uh, big neighborhoods. There's some there here in Southern California. There's a small that was in uh, Lake Forest. They bulldoze down the whole entire thing, everything. And they're going to do mixed. There's going to be apartments. There's going to be parks. There's going to be a little bit of business. And then there will be uh, some townhomes as well. So you're getting quite a bit from what used to be a dying uh, dying uh, mall. And we're going to see more of this repurposing of commercial real estate. And that is the wave of the future. So I saw a report from Redfin saying that empty nest boomers today own twice as many large homes in comparison to millennials with children. How can we fix this issue? And is this a argument for the silver tsunami, the tsunami claim? Yeah, well, the silver, it's, there's no silver tsunami. I have silver hair. I just bought my next house in 2019. I'm not planning on going anywhere either. So uh, I don't see this, in, and I'm, but I'm not a boomer. I want everybody to know that. Not a boomer. Uh, I, but uh, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of boomers that are just going to age in place. And we're not going to force them to move, unfortunately. They have these bigger houses and they haven't made a lot of room for these young families to move into their houses. Now, that starts to change in, in, uh, at, in 2030. You start to see the dial change because baby boomers are only going to get older to the point where they have to go to assisted living. And, and, uh, so, and there's going to be a point where there will be baby boomers that will be m moving at a higher rate to assisted living. The number one reason that buyers are moving right now is to get closer to kids. Well, who gets closer to kids? Boomers. So they are moving. They, it's just, there's just not this giant wave that everybody talked about, but there will be this ability to go in where these baby boomers are vacating these larger houses and purchasing these houses. They will come. It's just, you have to be patient and look for them, but it will increase. The threshold will increase as we get to 2030. It's this slow dial that slowly changes over time. No wave. And, uh, and you're not going to be able to make people move. There's the, uh, an entire industry uh, wrapped around people living in their houses and living out the rest of their lives in their houses. It's called aging in place. And they have all the different ways that people can just stay in their home and enjoy their houses. So uh, that you're, we're not going to see any kind of a wave. People want to live in the house that they raise their children in. And we're seeing that across the United States. It's just a, it's, it's a trend that doesn't look like it's going away. 
So I saw on your Facebook actually some chatter about California trying to tax um, Californians when they leave the state. Can you speak more on this topic on what it's about and um, just give a breakdown on it? Okay, so I had to do some research on this because it's a lot of white noise. Uh, but when a, a couple few people were talking, when there's a, more than one person talking about it, that means people are talking about it. So then I had to do enough research to figure out what it was. And basically, it's this another wealth tax that is only proposed and is having a lot of trouble going anywhere. And they're going to be sued anyways, even if they do do it. And that is basically they want to penalize uh, really companies. And, and anybody that has more than $30 million of assets and leaves the state of California because they have helped these businesses uh, quite a bit uh, stay in California. And they had a lot of tax breaks and different incentives and different things that they've done. And, and then these a after they do it all, some of these companies have left, uh, left California and see over there. And they're just looking at ways to... Uh, they have a deficit in California. They're not really supposed to have a state deficit. So as a result, they're looking for different ways to uh, uh, create more revenue. This is one of them. It's not a smart one. It's not going to happen. And it's going to be, it would be stuck in litigation, uh, even if it did happen. It's, it's uh, just a bill that's been out there. And it's brought up over and over again, but it's making a lot of noise and is entering the circles, which enters my chat. And then I do the research to figure out exactly what in the world are they talking about? Because I would know about it if it was if it was already passed. Well, awesome. Thank you again, everyone, for tuning in to another episode of Let's Talk Housing. If you want to learn more about what's going on in the real estate industry, head over to our YouTube. There's a bunch of good content over there. Or you can check out our website at uh, reportsonhousing.com. Please leave us a good review. We'd greatly appreciate it. And if you have any questions, feel free to post it on our social media, media at all. Or you can email me at info at reportsonhousing.com. We will see you soon and have a fantastic rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.